Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much uh, for coming along. You may have seen me, uh, not in this room, but another Google Talks room, maybe about four years ago when I was plugging on Book Tour uh, for my last book, The Knowledge, which is all about how you could reboot civilization after an apocalypse. So imagine that the sort of Walking Dead scenario has actually happened as a thought experiment. I, I don't think the end of the world is actually about to arrive. I don't have the end of the world is nigh placard around my chest. Uh, but as a scientist, I thought the notion of the apocalypse, that the idea of the loss of everything that we take for granted was a really good way of exploring how all of that works, how the modern world works, and what's going on behind the scenes to provide everything in everyday lives, and therefore what process you'd have to go through to restart, to reboot all of that in terms of transport or communications technology or growing food, um, if you were one of these hypothetical post-apocalyptic survivors. It's essentially that the, the scientific discoveries and the technological inventions that took us through 10,000 years of, of human history, from living in caves to the modern world of, of antibiotics, electricity, and, and skyscrapers. And what I wanted to do for this new book was kind of pull out the focus even further and not look at how human ingenuity and discovery and invention enables to build the modern world and progress through history, but how the world itself, the planet that we live on, has played a, a crucial role, a key part in that story of humanity. Going right back to the very beginnings, our origins as a bipedal intelligent species of, of ape in East Africa, through to the very emergence of agriculture and civilizations and then through the thousands of years of, of history, of the rise and fall of empires and different cultures and societies, right up to the modern age, the, the modern world of current affairs that you read about in the newspapers or, or, or modern political maps. There is the fingerprint, the signature of features of our planet behind all of that, pulling the strings in subtle ways. So I'm, I'm not saying that culture and sociology and people have not been important in history. Of course they have. What I'm saying is that beneath, and if you'll excuse the pun, beneath all of that is, is the bedrock, is the foundation of planet Earth, of processes like plate tectonics, or the geographical distribution of different resources, the circulation of the atmosphere high above our heads, which gave us the trade winds and the way of exploring around the world and building these huge transoceanic uh, trade routes in the very beginnings of globalization. And so this is what I've tried to explore in this new book, Origins, How the Earth made us, how Earth and planetary features have been often neglected when we talk about history and these grand themes, these grand trends over the centuries and the millennia. And what I wanted to do for, uh, for this afternoon was just pick out some of what I think are the most interesting narratives, the most interesting stories from this book, of those deep fundamental links from planet Earth to world history, to human history. And we might as well start the story at the beginning, in the making of us, in our origins and evolution in East Africa. This is our family tree, you can see on the left here. This is the hominin lineage, we, the, the, the human-like species. We split, we diverged from the chimpanzees about seven million years ago, and there have been dozens and dozens of human-like hominin species uh, up until Homo sapiens, which is our own species, um, down at the bottom, and this great big branching tree of evolution. And over time, we've become increasingly more bipedal. We've walked upright. We've got better at running quickly and efficiently. We've had uh, jumps. We've had increases in our cranial capacity, in our brain size, which has been linked to increases in our intelligence and our cultural ability and our ability to learn and, and solve problems. And so commensurate with all of this um, body evolution, we've got increasingly adept at technology, at tool use. And the very first tools two, three million years ago were, were literally just rocks strewn across uh, the East African floor with some Homo erectus plodding across the savanna, stubbing his or her toe on this rock and going, ugh, but then realizing that 
what stubby toe might be very good also for bashing other stuff with. And we, we invented technology, we invented tools by stuff we could just pick up and find lying around us. And then the story from there was with us getting better at refining and processing and tuning what we could extract and harvest from the natural world to be better at what we needed to do, better tools. Leading up to Stone Age technology of things like very uh, fine chips of obsidian or flint, which give you very sharp spear uh, heads or, or arrow heads. And all of this story of our evolution as hominins and a lot of this technological development happened in this part of the world, in East Africa. This is the cradle of humanity. And, and incidentally, it's where I spent my own childhood, growing up in Nairobi and going most weekends and, and, and safari and going to a school called the Banda, which is Swahili for mud hut. I went to the mud hut school in East Africa and in Kenya. And one of the key transformations that drove our evolution from tree swinging apes to bipedal, upright, running, intelligent hominins was that the area around us had to dry out beneath our feet. You have to turn rainforest, forest into grasslands, into savannah, to drive that fundamental evolutionary change. And there's a very quirky truth right in the core of, of that fundamental part of our own evolution. If we zoom out from East Africa to look at the globe, so I became a massive map nerd when I was researching and writing origins. I've come from a biological background, and all of the maps you'll see in this talk and the ones which are in the figures in, in the book are maps I've written myself by writing some cartographic software to show different features of the planet and then layer uh, human things or other geographical things on, on top of them. Uh, so you'll be seeing lots of full color high resolution maps, which I totally nerded out about. And if you zoom out to, to the entire world, here's East Africa. And if you just allow your eyes to follow around that equatorial region of the planet, it's all smothered with rainforest, the Amazon rainforest, the rainforest, the Congo and, and central Africa, the rainforest, the archipelago of the East Indies. Apart from this weird little corner of aridity, East Africa is dry. It should be wet. Everything else in that part of the planet is damp and moist and covered in rainforest, apart from where we evolved. And so what was going on, what drove that drying out of East Africa from beneath our ancestors' feet, was there was a great big plume of magma rising up from deep in Earth's interior and pushing up into the underside of the continental plate of Africa. And if we strip away this satellite image and show you instead the topography of the land, the landscape of East Africa, coloured in red here are the Ethiopian highlands. This is literally the zit that formed on the face of planet Earth as this magma plume rose up and pushed beneath it and then started to rip tear open the crust of the planet into this characteristic Y shape of the Red Sea that ripped so deep that it then filled with the ocean, the Gulf of Aden over here, and then the third arm of that Y shape feature is the East African Rift Valley, passing all the way down south here. And the landscape of that rift valley, of that feature of plate tectonics, of, of Africa tearing itself apart, is that you have a very low valley floor. You, you have a tube, you have a tunnel of a low valley floor with towering mountainous ridges on either side. There are walls that are formed in East Africa that block moisture coming in from the ocean or coming in from the rainforests on the other side. And it's that rising of the, of the land, of the continent, with that magma plume and the features of that tectonic rift valley that dried out East Africa from beneath our feet. That drove that fundamental evolutionary process. But what's been puzzling paleontologists for, for quite a while, and we've only really started to understand this now, is well, what was it specifically about the East African rift valley that drove our evolution to be so exquisitely intelligent and adaptable and versatile. Plenty of places around the world dry out. There's nothing unique about that. What crafted us to be so intelligent as a species of ape? And what's been emerging in, in recent years from scientists is that there is a unique combination of conditions in this part of the world. We have those walls of the Rift Valley that collect the rainwater, 
does fall, funnel it down into the lakes strung along the valley floor. And so these lakes are exceedingly sensitive. The level of those lakes is exceedingly sensitive to tiny fluctuations in the local climate and in, in how rainy it is between the hot valley floor and the rainy mountainous ridges. So the specific landscape of the Rift Valley is interacting with cosmic cycles, the so-called Milankovitch cycles and Earth's tilt or wobbles in its orbit around the sun. And during periods of this extreme climatic instability, we see bursts of evolution in that hominin line. Emergence of new species, jumps in brain capacity, jumps in the tools that have been created. We are very literally children of plate tectonics. It's that earth-moving process that drove our evolution as such a, as an intelligent species of ape. But although plate tectonics here created as a species, we, we didn't remain in our cradle. We, we've come as far away as places like London. We have migrated around the planet. And this brings us to a different chapter in Earth's history and in our own history. What was it that enabled humanity to migrate out of East Africa to colonize every major continent around the planet, to become the most widely spread animal species in the world? This is the, the, the world, the map we'd recognize today. We, we, we're familiar with those outlines of the continents, with the coastlines. But the world did not look like this when we were emerging and migrating out of East Africa about 70,000 years ago. The world looked very, very different back then. The world was in the depths of the last great ice age. And in fact, that last ice age was only the most recent in a sequence of 50 or 60 ice ages in the last two million years. There's pulse after pulse after pulse of ice age. And the most recent one saw the growth of these great big glaciers and ice sheets, particularly across the northern hemisphere. And this sucked out so much water from the oceans that sea levels around the world dropped by over 100 meters, up to about 120 meters, and literally exposed uh, the seabed. The seabed emerged as dry land. And of particular importance for the human story, for our migration around the world, particular land bridges appeared uh, between islands, between different land masses. So the Sunda land bridge and the Sahul land bridge opened up in Southeast Asia and Australasia. We could migrate along the southern margin of Eurasia, around India, down through Southeast Asia, and simply walk to colonize those <coughs> islands without having to get our feet wet. And most critically, of most importance to the thousands of years of human history after this, we were able to walk across the Bering Land Bridge from northeast um, Siberia all the way across into Alaska and the Americas. And as we were migrating out of our birthplace in East Africa, we encountered our sibling species, other hominin species, other human-like species that have migrated out of Africa before us and were living in Europe and Central Asia, and the Neanderthals, you've probably already heard of. But there are also the Denisovans, a whole species of humanity, sharing the world with us very recently, only a few tens of thousands of years ago. And all we know about this entire species of humanity has come from a few tiny fragments of finger bone. That is all that has remained of that species, and it preserved and protected in a cave. But we've been able to extract the DNA out of those uh, finger bones, sequence them and recognize the signature of the Denisovans in our own DNA, in our own genome. We not just encountered these other human species, but we got quite friendly with them. We interbred with them. We carry their DNA inside ourselves like a cargo, a genetic cargo, as we then continue that migration to populate the entire planet. And when we crossed into North America and then into South America, no previous hominin species had ever made it that far. As we walked down through the Americas, we were walking where no human species had ever trodden before. And then with the easing of the last ice age, the melting of the great ice sheets, the rising of the sea level, these two great hemispheres of the planet, of Eurasia and the Americas, once again became severed, became separated by each other as the sea levels rose and uh, inundated, resubmerged that bearing land bridge. These 
two human populations which are essentially genetically identical. Both had access to wild species of plants and animals that they could domesticate and invent agriculture and start on two independent experiments in civilization, completely out of contact with each other. And it was only thousands of years later when Europeans started applying technology of sails and ships to cross the Atlantic, first with Columbus, to rediscover these lands, that these two great civilizations or clusters of civilizations once again became into contact with each other. Now, the first civilizations to arise after we had migrated out of Africa, exploiting those quirky climactic conditions of the last ice age and the very low sea levels. The first civilizations to arose uh, were in this part of the world. This is the Arabian Peninsula. I've just shown for you here um, the plate boundaries, those orange lines, the fractures in the skin of our planet where these great big chunks of crust, the tectonic plates are moving and drifting around relative to each other um, in very, very slow time scale from a human point of view, but scudding across the surface of the Earth. You look at the whole history of the planet. And we've talked already about the opening up of the Rift Valley and the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden that drove our own evolution. And it was almost as if a chunk of Africa was torn off as the Arabian Peninsula and has been drifting away ever since. This whole Arabian Peninsula has been swinging, or swinging away like a barn door caught in the wind and has slammed into the underside of Eurasia, the Eurasian continental landmass. And when continents slam into each other, you drive up mountain ranges. And what happened here was the crumpling up of the Zagros mountain range. And running along the, um, running alongside parallel of the Zagros mountain range is the region that we, we've come to call Mesopotamia. So the rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates flowing down alongside the feet of the Zagros Mountains. And this Mesopotamia, this land between the rivers, um, around 3000 BC, became the land of cities. It saw the emergence of the first civilization of the Sumerians. People had settled down, domesticated wild plant and animal species, put them into the field to grow as agriculture, built up enough of a food surplus to, field, to, to feed growing numbers of, of people, which clumped together into increasing densities in towns and then cities, and civilization emerged out of that process. But even here, we see the fingerprint of the tectonic. It was a tectonic process that drove our evolution as a species. It was a tectonic setting that created the perfect conditions for the emergence of the ver very first civilizations as well. Because whenever you have a great big range of mountains, like the Zagros here, it sags right down into the crust of the planet. You get a line of mountains and their characteristic tectonic trough running alongside it, where it's sagging down. And clearly that the rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, have been flowing downhill through that. But they've also been eroding out the very young mountains up here, which are still rich in nutrients, and depositing that as very, very fine, silty, alluvial so soil, very, very fertile soil, which are well watered by those rivers. The reason, that agri the reason agriculture became so productive and civilization emerged here is because the earth had created the conditions that made it very, very simple because of this foreland basin sagging down alongside that mountain range. And when the Mesopotamian civilizations were emerging around 3000 BC, on the other side of the planet, around in India, in an identical tectonic setting, in the, in the foreland basin, the tectonic trough running alongside the Himalayan mountain range, the Indus Valley civilization was popping up around the same time. Two different parts of the world, same moment, same tectonic setting. It's this earth process that also gave us, betrothed us, um, civilization itself. Now, civilization spread from these origin points, from these sources, from places like Mesopotamia, and spread into the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean is a place that we, we've heard lots about from, from history lessons and, and TV documentaries. It has been 
a bubbling, broiling cauldron of dozens of different cultures and societies and civilizations and empires for thousands of years of history, right from the beginnings of the Bronze Age through the Phoenicians, the Minoans, the Etruscans, the ancient Greeks, the Romans. But when you think about it, all of this ancient history, all these classical civilizations, all of antiquity, all of that activity was happening on one half of this oval-shaped Sea of the Mediterranean and not the other half. All of that civilization and activity was happening on the northern part, the northern lip of the Mediterranean, and not the North African coastline, not the southern part. These, these places aren't far apart. There's only a couple hundred kilometers from one side to the next. So why has there been this great disparity, this great difference that's continued for thousands of years through history between one side of that sea and the other? And to understand that, we need to see where the Mediterranean Sea came from. And it turns out the Mediterranean is no more than a tiny puddle left behind as the remnant of a once vast, vast ocean, an ocean that was as big as the Atlantic in its heyday, which is called the Tethys. And if we wind back Earth history, uh, almost quarter of a billion years, 240 million years ago, all the continents had slid into a single great landmass, a supercontinent called Pangaea, the all land. And held in the cup of this C-shaped supercontinent was the Tethys Ocean. And almost as soon as Pangaea had formed, it started tearing itself apart again. An unrelenting un uh, process of plate tectonics and continental drift tore apart the supercontinent to create uh, the Americas, Africa, Eurasia, and first Africa, and then India broke away and headed back north again and recollided with Eurasia. And as Africa rode north, it essentially swallowed up this once great ocean of the Tethys. And all that remains today is crammed between Europe and Africa is the Mediterranean Sea. It's this oval-shaped puddle from, from that once vast ocean. Specifically, what is happening right now is that Africa is being subducted beneath the Eurasian plate. It's Africa that is plunging down and being melted and destroyed in the fiery depths of, of Earth's interior. And that process has crumpled up the northern Mediterranean coastline. It is riddled, full of lots of archipelagos and islands and inlets and coves and bays. And when the sea level uh, is high, like it is at the moment between the Ice Ages, this creates an, a fantastically intricate and complex coastline full of natural harbors. The North Mediterranean is ideally set up for seafaring societies, like the Minoans, the Phoenicians, the Greeks. Whereas the southern half of the Mediterranean, because of the African continent being destroyed, it is smooth and flat and boring. It is unaccommodating doesn't provide you natural harbors. And about the only exceptions throughout history of great civilizations on the other half of the Mediterranean have been the Egyptian civilization huddled around this linear oasis of the Nile flowing through the desert. And Carthage, which appeared up here where there is a natural harbor and came to challenge even the might of the Romans before they lost and were literally obliterated and wiped off the face of the map by, by the Roman Republic. But on those two uh, exceptions, the southern Mediterranean coastline has, has been quiet and empty. And again, that comes down to these fundamental earth-moving processes of, of how features of our planet have dictated long themes and long trends of our history. If you bring this story, so I'm, I'm skipping over through like, quite a few chapters of the book, but if you bring this story up to much more into the modern age, into more recent history. And I want to tell you the story of, of how Europe spread out to discover the world. Uh, this map here is, is slightly confusing because I want to show you the geography of the seas instead of the geography of the land. So this is the Atlantic. This is the northwest bulge of, of, of Africa. There's Europe at the top, and then the peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, with what was to become the modern states of, of Portugal and Spain there. And for centuries, Europe had been a backwater. We were primitive. 
we were left out. We were right on the outskirts of, of all the action across Eurasia. We were right on the extremity of the Silk Roads and all the exchange of trade and knowledge and culture and ideas and people. We were primitive and backwards compared to the rest of Eurasia. And it was only with the beginning of the 1400s when Portuguese and then Spanish sailors turned in the opposite direction. They headed out into this vast, stormy ocean that people had just avoided for good sense and had been uh, focusing themselves in crossing the Mediterranean or maybe edging down the African coast slightly. But the Portuguese sailors first started heading out into the Atlantic Ocean as a whole. And the stepping stones that drew them out into this great ocean were the Atlantic archipelagos, islands like Madeira, the Canary Islands, the Azores. And you can very easily head down from Europe along the North African coast following the direction the prevailing winds blow you anyway and the currents are already flowing. That step is easy. The Phoenicians have been doing that for thousands of years. But to get back home again in a sailing ship is difficult. You can't simply turn around and go back the way you came because you'll be fighting against the very winds and currents that took you there in the first place. And so the realization that that transformation point in history was when the Portuguese captains realized that Paradoxically, to get home, you head further out into the depths of the ocean. You, you complete what's known as a volta do mar, a return of the sea. You turn out deeper into the ocean, where you now encounter a different pattern of winds and currents, which allows you to then turn back uh, to home, to the port that you came from. And as they completed a wider volta do mar by heading further down the African coast, that loop took them across the Azores, and they discovered those as well. They realized that to sail around over large distances, you have to hop back and forth between different regions of the wind system uh, around the planet and the ocean currents that those blow around. And since the 1400s, we've pieced together not just this little jigsaw piece of the entire puzzle. We now have the global view of how Earth's atmosphere moves, but where the winds come from. And it's a simple is the fact that around the equator, it's sunny, it's warm, the warm air rises, rolls over through high altitude before sinking back down towards the ground again, and then returns to the equator um, as what we would call winds across the surface. And the only other important fact is that while that great big churning circulation current is going on, it's identical to what happens over one of your radiators at home, the Earth is spinning, is turning beneath that circulation current. So you get the Coriolis effect, which deflects the winds heading back towards the equator to one side. These are the trade winds. They always blow towards the west. Columbus realized that all he had to do was follow downwind, and it would carry him towards the west, towards what he hoped was China um, or Japan. And he stumbled across instead the Americas, a, a continent that no one had anticipated would even be there. To return home again, you can't just go back the way you came, fighting the very winds that took you there. You hop north ever so slightly to put yourself into a different circulation current of Earth's atmosphere, which generate the westerly winds that blow you very neatly in the opposite direction. There are these stripes of wind bands blowing in opposite directions around the planet, which serve very effectively as conveyor belts. You pop yourself in one, flow down, down wind to where you want to be, pop up to the next one, come back home again. And it was that fundamental realization that you can predict where the winds will be at different places that enabled us to explore around the entire world, build these great big trade links across the oceans, joining together the continents in a way that never happened before. This is the, the Portuguese route. They completed their uh, exploration down the African coast, around the southern tip of Africa, and eventually reached India and the Spice Islands that they've been striving for all the time. And by taking that wide Volta do Mar through the southern Atlantic, you ended up looping around so far they stumbled across the coast of Brazil, the South America. The reason that Brazil speaks Portuguese, not Spanish, like the rest of that entire continent, is because these Portuguese captains stumbled across it because that's the way the wind blows you when you're trying to get around the southern tip of Africa. The Spanish first with uh, Columbus crossed the Atlantic, then down around the south coast of, of uh, the Americas and discovered a whole new sea, the peaceful sea, the Pacific. 
And they realized conveniently that exactly the same patterns of winds repeated there as well. They built the longest running sailing trade route of history, taking stuff they bought off the Chinese, the silk, um, incense, um, and, other, and other luxury goods, hopped up into the westerly winds, crossed the Pacific to the coast of the Americas and to California, headed down the coast to pick up the stuff uh, from the silver mines that they were working, and then back across the trade winds, across the whole Pacific, to complete that loop. And the reason, therefore, that California, historically, the reason it became so important, and cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco and San Diego, the reason all that exists is simply because that is the only place the wind takes you to when you've been crossing the Pacific. That's where it drops you off. That's where you need to found your cities and your colonies to resupply the ships so they can then head back further down into the opposite wind van. Um, the Dutch in the 1700s discovered a shortcut across the Indian Ocean, not going around the long way around the coast, but cutting straight across through um, a band of winds called the Roaring Forties. The westerly winds in the southern hemisphere don't encounter great continents or mountain rain ranges that act as walls to block the wind. So the winds down there are much, much fiercer, much stronger. There is literally a motorway in the ocean that you plop yourself into and can easily halve the travel time up into the Spice Islands. Australia was discovered by Dutch captains nipping along that shortcut. But you also need to know when to take your turn off from that motorway. And the coral reefs off the western coast of Australia are absolutely littered with shipwrecks from captains that missed their turning. They were bombing down the Roaring Forties, didn't turn north early enough and drove themselves uh, onto those coral reefs um, and wrecked themselves. And then finally, but arguably most crucially, the subsequent history, um, um, for, the, for subsequent history was the Atlantic Trade Triangle. Manufactured goods were taken from, uh, from Britain, from North Europe. We were going through the early stage of the Industrial Revolution. We were using machinery to make things for ourselves rather than people. And those textiles, those cloths, the weapons were taken down the ancient Portuguese route to West Africa, where they were sold, and the ships loaded up instead with forced human labor, slaves. People were kidnapped, um, forced onto the ships, carried across the trade winds to the colonies in the Americas, and not just in North America, but also in Brazil and, in, and South America, where they were forced to work on the plantations around those colonies, growing plants like cotton and tobacco and tea and coffee. And those raw materials that the product of that slave labor was then loaded back into ships and carried along the westerly winds back to Britain and Europe, where the, the cotton fiber was turned using the machines into the textiles, which were then taken back down to Africa. So it was a very neatly closed loop. And with every turn of that economic cog, it generated huge profits for its masters, for the slave masters. Um, but fundamentally blown around by those patterns of circulation in Earth's atmosphere. It is simply the case that some places are easy to sail to and others are difficult. That's what dictates where your trade routes emerge. That's what dictates where your trading posts, your colonies have to be placed. That dictated the pattern of empire building, the first the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Dutch and the French and British. And so in the early stages of globalization, the making of the modern world that we are all familiar with today, it was fundamentally the winds that created that pattern that has determined so much of, of the modern world. The last example I wanted to show you was to bring things right up um, to the modern age. Skipping through our origins as a species and the emergence of civilization through thousands of years of these grand themes of world history to show how you can see even the fingerprint and the signature of the planetary in the political, in political maps. And the example I want to show you is um, the politics of this place, of the, the southern states of America. And if we strip away the satellite view and instead show you the political view, the political map, 
This is the voting behavior in the last presidential election. This is the, 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 the election that voted Trump into the White House. And unsurprisingly, the southern states of America are on the whole staunch Republican. There is a sea of red across this whole continental region. Some counties did vote blue, voted the Democrats. But curiously, those Democrat, Democrat voting counties aren't sprinkled randomly. They're not peppered across these states. There is a very clear pattern and structure to where counties happen to vote for the Democrats. There's Democrat voting counties along the line of the Mississippi. This, this one stands out. This is, this is obvious. But what is much, much more curious is this arc, this crescent of Democrat voting counties that, that bears no relation to anything on the ground. You know, this isn't along a river valley. It's not, or not along any particular terrain in the world. This is the topological map of the same region. This is the Mississippi uh, River and then Delta down here. The mountain range here um, was crumpled up in the previous cycle of supercontinent building. Plate tectonics, a whole chapter bef um, before Pangaea and the last one we spoke about. These are the, the Appalachians. And if instead of the terrain I show you the geology, the kind of rocks that we have underground, and I'll show you rocks which are 70 million years old. And they form in this particular arc-shaped crescent through the southern states. These are rocks on the surface which have been eroded down, which are 70 million years old. And if I overlay on top of that again the political map, that correlation, that correspondence is un undeniable. For some reason, people voted for Hillary rather than Trump in the last election, and indeed any election you care to look back, back through to the, to the Civil War, voted for Democrats if they happened to have rocks beneath their feet, which were 70 million years old. Why on earth would that be? These aren't geologists. They're not digging boreholes and going, hmm, well, this is 60 million years old. I'm a bit too early. I'm going to have to vote Trump. Ugh. Why would that be? And the story here is a wonderfully fascinating sequence of, of cause and effect, stretching through centuries of human history and then back through millions of years of planetary history. 17 million years ago, when those rocks were first laid down, the Earth was in a chapter of its history called the Cretaceous. The sea levels were very, very high back then, and the ocean flooded, swamped right through continental North America um, in a great interior inland sea. And it dumped what was essentially sea floor mud across, the, across a great big area, which has been compacted down, had other strata of rock layered on top of it, which has then been eroded back. So this is the seafloor mud which has been re-exposed here, which produces a soil when it's eroded and weathered, which is very dark, very rich, very, uh, full of nutrients, very fertile. And the, in the early 1800s, it realized that that particular soil is particularly good for growing a cash crop that people wanted to sell back to Britain and Europe to make some money for themselves, for growing cotton. Now, unlike other crops like uh, wheat or rice, which, which are easy to harvest, you just chop them off in the field, take it elsewhere, shake it a bit, and your grain falls off. With cotton, it's incredibly finicky and fiddly to pull off the, the, the bolus, the, the ball of cotton fibers off the plant. That means human fingers. And in this period of history, unfortunately and tragically, that meant slave labor. That meant people that had been abducted in, in Africa, taken across that Atlantic Passage that we saw in the chapter about the winds, forced to work on those plantations. And even hundreds of years later, after the Civil War, after emancipation, freedom, slavery, after the Civil Rights Movement, this crescent of 70 million year old rocks, this Cretaceous region, still has the highest density of African Americans living there. People that unfortunately are still afflicted with socioeconomic problems, being generally poor, having access to poor health care or poor schooling. People that would tend to vote, therefore, for Democrat promises and ideals rather than Republican. And indeed, the town that I've shown here, sorry, the city of Montgomery, this is where in the 1950s a black woman called Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white gentleman on the bus. The very event that triggered the entire civil rights movement that transformed American society and politics, the very epicenter 
was right there, smack in the middle of that band of 70 million year old rocks. This is a whole chain of causation through hundreds of years of history and then millions of years of our planetary past that explains the politics we see even today. And just to prove to you that I've not cherry-picked the only example around the world where that is true, where that works, uh, there's another quick example here closer to home. Uh, this is Britain on the left, and I've shown the constituencies in red that voted Labour in the last general election, and indeed vote Labour in pretty much any election you care to look at. These are the, La the Labour heartlands. On the right, I've shown uh, rocks beneath the ground which are 320 million years old. And again, there is a, an astonishing correlation, a correspondence between people voting Labour and happening to have rocks beneath their feet which are 320 million years old. I won't go into the reasons behind that, try to have a bit of a, a, bit of a think, but if I give you a, a clue, that the name of Earth's, the chapter of Earth's history 320 million years ago was the Carboniferous. That is when the great coal fields were laid down. Something strange happened in our planet's past 320 million years ago where the planet's recycling system broke down. Trees thrived and grew and died and fell over and men would just not rot. And it built up these huge deposits of peat and then coal, which powered first Britain and then the rest of Europe and the world through the Industrial Revolution. And from that um, other chapter of our planet's history. So I've just tried to pick out um, some of the narratives, some of the stories that I found most fascinating and most awe-inspiring when I was researching and writing for this book, Origins, about where we came from as a species, how we migrated around the entire world, where civilizations first emerged, um, how it enabled us to explore around the planet and globalize. There are some other uh, examples I've thrown up here from elsewhere in the book, which, which is basically the clickbait. Uh, there's stories in, the, in Origins in the book, such as why do most of us eat a bowl of cereal or a slice of toast for breakfast? There's a deep planetary reason why we eat these cereal crops um, for, as a staple for basically every single meal of every single human around the world. Uh, there's a story about why it was that Holland's drowned landscape after the, the end of the last ice age helped create the modern financial system. Um, so you can read up on any of those uh, in this book as well. Um, I think some of you who are lucky have nabbed yourself a free copy. Um, if any of you were not lucky enough to grab a free copy, um, you can pick it off from any good bookshop. Um, it's still in hardback at the moment. And there are some other books, um, what I did. Uh, my last one was The Knowledge, which is this book about how to reboot civilization after an apocalypse as a way for exploring the history of science and technology again. And I've written a few books on my actual field of research, which is in astrobiology and the possibility of life on other planets. I spend my day job thinking about hardy bacteria and how they could survive on the Martian surface, and more importantly, how we could detect that they are there um, looking for so-called biosignatures using spectroscopic techniques. Um, so you can read up on that sort of stuff as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about global warming. So do you think that it's a man-made process, or is it just how the Earth is evolving? And how do you think is it affecting the formation of land and oceans that you just explained? Um, so the, the question then was about global warming and whether I believe it to be um, human driven or, or I guess um, part of natural cycles. And I would say there is no shadow of a doubt that global warming is happening. There is an increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is driving increasing average temperatures around the world, and those are both being caused by human activity, by our industry, by our shipping, by our factories, by our cars. Um, and without getting, uh, without getting too apocalyptic about it all, we are clearly facing a very great challenge in our very near-term future, in the next years and decades. And we need to start making some difficult decisions about how we respond to that challenge. We are, we're going to have to change as a society rather than just individuals, and there will be no single technological fix to this problem. That, that, is, that is my belief. Um, I'm not a, a planetary scientist or an Earth scientist, but that is my understanding from talking to a lot of colleagues um, who are. In terms of what effects that might have on, on the kind of grand scale of things, it will clearly affect us humans and our, and our civilization greatly. 
But looking on the wider scheme of, of planetary history, as I've been doing throughout this talk and, and do throughout the book, one effect of this human-driven global warming is that we've probably already cancelled the next ice age. Even if we were to stop all carbon emissions tomorrow, we've already pumped out enough that when these Milankovic cycles, these, these cosmic cycles in Earth tilt and its orbit around the sun, next fall into sync that makes the northern hemisphere much colder, which would have triggered an ice age, it, it will not happen when those Milankovic cycles fall back into sync again. We, we've warmed the world already uh, too much for that to occur. One could argue perhaps that would be a good thing from the human perspective. If I, if I go back to the, the map of the world during the last ice age, um, clearly there are huge challenges we need to solve with uh, sea level rising, changing in the climate, changing the distribution of rainfall and drought, and where we can grow crops to feed 7 billion people. But if we're looking thousands of years in the future and we have cities in the Northern Hemisphere, things get quite tricky if there's four kilometers of ice sheet grinding over your cities. So one could argue that maybe in the long term, from a human perspective alone, cancer the next ice age might be a good thing. Yeah? Uh, as someone who thinks about apocalypses and the effect of the kind of globe or the earth on humanity, uh, what's your opinion on, on human civilization on other planets in either the short term, Elon Musk style, or even very, very long term? Yeah, so um, the last book, The Knowledge, I, I wrote, that there's different ways you could tell the same story. I picked the apocalypse because I think everyone loves The Walking Dead and it was a, it was a neat little, um, could almost kind of a cliche to, to latch onto. Exactly the same story could have been told. You are launching uh, to another planet. What is the minimum set of civilization you need to put in a suitcase, put in a spacecraft and go with you? And the Polynesians were doing this thousands of years ago. They, they had a set of plants that provided everything they needed for Polynesian society, and they packed it into a canoe and headed off towards the horizon to colonize um, you know, all of the islands in, in, the, in, the, in the far Pacific. So it is a really interesting question. How could you have an outpost of humanity, a colony of humanity on another planet? Mars would be uh, the natural choice after the moon for putting a permanent human presence. However, having said that, even under the best perfect conditions of a midsummer lunchtime on Mars, the conditions are unrelentingly brutal compared to the South Pole of the Earth. It is punishingly cold, very low atmosphere. You can't even take certain things for granted, such as being able to breathe the air or, or have ready access to lots of water. You have to, to fight for everything you need to survive on Mars. And the problem with, with space missions is that you can't, you are, you are severely limited in the amount of mass you can send somewhere. So a lot of what's being talked about is called in situ resource utilization. How do you live off the land when you get to Mars? And some of the research I've been doing links into things such as where can you get water from on Mars? How do you turn that water into oxygen that you can breathe? How can you um, perhaps have life support systems which are biological in their nature? using things like algae to grow by sunlight on Mars to create the oxygen you need to breathe. All of these things are, are fascinating areas of research, but, but we are not there yet in terms of the delivery of those, of actually having practical applications and solutions from them. So I applaud Elon Musk's efforts um, of trying to get to Mars in the next 10, 15 years, or whatever number he's put on it. Um, I do not think we will have a human presence um, on Mars in 10, 15 years. I would be surprised if we have the first return mission to Mars in 10, 15 years. Um, and personally, I would argue that we should be spending more time practicing on the moon, where if something goes wrong, you're a day or two's flight back to the Earth. If something goes wrong on Mars, you're six months, eight months, a year away from help. Um, it is a completely different, it's an order of magnitude, different uh, proposition for putting people on Mars and then supporting them on, on Mars as well. Hi. For reasons that should become obvious from my accent, can you go back to your Southern American state? Are you, are you perchance <laughs> yeah. from... I, I am. 
Can, can I ask, did you have rocks that were 70, 70 million years old? Ah, but I've got an interesting observation from your slide. This was, you'll see in Alabama that there's one outlier that's outside the Cetaceous Belt, major outlier that's above it there to the north. Uh, do you mean this bit? No, no, to the north of the that belt. Bit. That's Georgia. Alabama is more to your... Uh, this one here? Yeah. No, uh, that one? That, no, no, farther down. <laughs> no, 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 no. Farther south, right? Go south. There you go, that one, which is outside the Cetaceous Belt. Well, that's, Birmingham. Study geography. That's, Birmingham. <laughs> that's Birmingham, Alabama, that's where I'm from. Uh, that one is different from the others, and it's a great confirmation of your theory, and I was wondering if you know about it. Um, for, for the sake of your own dramatic delivery, yeah. of course I know, but I, but I think for everyone else. It's such a wonderful, it's such a wonderful confirmation of your theory. Uh, that's Birmingham. Birmingham is a turn-of-the-century industrial city, and it's the last uh, mountain in the Appalachians, is Red Mountain, in Birmingham, Alabama. Because of that, is the only place on Earth that has the three elements you need to make steel. And after slavery, uh, people were basically enslaved in a post-slavery slavery in Birmingham working the coal mines, black people worked the coal mines. Because of that, Birmingham is the only majority black major city in Alabama, and that's the reason it's blue. That is fascinating, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. There, there's a, another really interesting story about um, the Appalachians and the availability of coal which is suitable for smelting iron and then creating steel, and how that held back the adoption of the Industrial Revolution in the States, in America at the time, um, compared to Europe, um, which, is, which is also in the book. Hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could touch on, or perhaps if your book touches on, when you look at a satellite map of Earth at night, and do you see, you realize the majority of most populated cities are above the equator in the northern hemisphere. There you go. I had that ready to go. <laughs> um, and I was wondering if you were five able, after, so. <laughs> uh, could touch on why a uh, majority of the cities are above the equator, and perhaps if the shape of continents have anything to do with it. Um, so I joke, but you basically spiked the perfect uh, plant question from the audience, because that is exactly what I talk about in the very final chapter of the book, of, of uh, the code where I bring together all the threads from all 10 different chapters into one map. Uh, this is artificial illumination around the world. So it's, it's basically a heat map, if you like, of humans, um, or at least humans living in dense urbanizations. And there are some really nice patterns that, again, just jump out of you when you look at where we are around the world today. Equatorial regions tend to be relatively sparsely populated. There's dense forest there. It's hard to put a city in the middle of the Amazon. Um, around 30 degrees north or south, when that great big circulation current Earth's atmosphere descends back to the ground, the air is very, very dry. That is where the great deserts of the planet are always found. The Sahara is, is, dense, is, is not densely populated. Um, the interior desert of Australia is not densely populated. But the places where we do see dense population are interesting in their own right. You can see things like the Nile Valley, the Indus Valley, just burningly bright um, in these otherwise arid parts of the world. The band of lights um, you can see here, that is the old steppes belt. That is like the prairies uh, of Eurasia, these great grasslands which um, had a, a defining role in Eurasian history for thousands of years because out of the steps that these horse people repeatedly emerged, it was the Huns that collapsed, the Western Roman Empire, the Mon Mongolians came out of the steps, um, and there's this great um, tension between the nomadic pastoralists of the steppes region and all the civilizations around the margins of Eurasia. The, the Great Wall of China was a defensive wall, but fundamentally it follows an ecological line between dry places with only grasslands and therefore horse people and wetter parts where you can grow crops and therefore have cities. And those steps have since been um, dug up with you know, mechanized agriculture and artificial fertilizer and now some of the most productive wheat fields in the planet. The slightly thinner line down here, that's the root of the old Silk Roads. That's the string, it's like a, a string of pearls, a string of cities strung along the Silk Roads um, going around the northern part of, of the Himalayas. So there's, there's some really nice patterns you can pull out of just looking where people are active today and, and how that has been created through thousands of years of world history and how the planet has had the determining influence behind those thousands of years of world history. Oh, yeah, I was wondering um, if you were able to find other patterns in the US by controlling for gerrymandering. Um, <laughs> and well, in that area, it's 
probably something that would be valuable. It's, it's not something I have done. I, I agree it's something that would be very interesting to look at. I, I wonder if gerrymandering is essentially smudging out what might have been a, a, a good signal otherwise. Because that's, you know, one political party trying to get the upper hand by fiddling where, where, where the distribution of people is. Right. Well, usually it would look like something like there, like putting all the Democrats in one tiny little thing. So it might, yeah, might make it clear. Might, might polarize what would have been an otherwise right. smoother distribution. Thank you. With that, please join me in a round of applause for Dave Thank you.